book, the Oxford University Press, uh, Hegel's concept of, on the concept of life, which received some amazing reviews already. Uh, and it was, I mean, we decided to have it as our last um, session in the hope that indeed the Board of Trust would still meet when they normally meet, which is mid-April, because I didn't know with COVID, but I was hoping, so that we'll be able to also celebrate with the book, Karen's tenure and promotion to associate professor. Yes, it takes effect Thank officially you. in August, but here to Karen, please give Karen a hand. Not just, I mean- Thank in, you. <laughs> Karen gave three births this year, uh, a book, a, a son, and a doctor's son. <laughs> so it's a very, it's a momentous, it's a momentous end of the semester. Uh, and uh, hopefully next semester we'll all be able to meet in person, not that we'll stop our, I think that this is a great format. Um, okay, that's, and um, one of the things I want to remind everyone, and Emma will post a link. We will continue with VAMP meetings. Over the summer, we'll have one a month, uh, and Emma will keep posting them. So we would not, and hopefully, of course, next, <coughs> <coughs> next, uh, we'll continue with next semester. Hopefully Emma would be here already next semester as well, rather than, although listen, right now, I envy you the coast of Catania. <laughs> anyway, but um, hope to be there in a month. Uh, so I think we can say it's 105. So I think it's time to start. And as they said, there was, they reached an agreement this morning and Kelly would begin with a 15 minutes of general overview of the book. Then Jason will follow with several comments. Uh, Jason Jonathan of John Hopkins. And then Karen will uh, follow with 15 minutes and then we'll open it to the public. Again, when for your questions, please post in the chat and I'll call upon you. So without much ado, I turn it over to Kelly. Yeah, thank you, Adit. Thank you so much for uh, including me in this event. I'm really glad to be here and uh, honored to um, present with Karen on this panel, uh, who's written a, a fantastic and educational book on, on Hegel's thought. Um, so let me just begin then. Uh, Karen Ng's Hegel's concept of life, self-consciousness, freedom, and logic tracks the development of a logical concept of life across Hegel's major works, starting with one of his first publications, the highly technical Differenzschrift, an analysis of the differences between Fichte and Schelling's philosophical systems, and culminating in the all-important science of logic, where Hegel establishes the systematic purport of the idea of life for his philosophical method and system as a whole. To prime our discussion of Karen's study, uh, it's worth reviewing how Hegel describes his subject matter in the science of logic. The system of logic, he writes in one famous passage, is the realm of shadows, the world of simple essentialities freed from all sensuous concreteness. The study of this science to dwell and labor in this shadowy realm is the absolute culture and discipline of consciousness. In logic, consciousness is busy with something remote from sensuous intuitions and aims, from feelings, from the merely imagined world of figurate uh, conception. Considered from its negative aspect, the business consists in holding off the contingency of ordinary thinking and the arbitrary selection of particular grounds or their opposites as valid. But above all, thought acquires thereby self-reliance and independence. It becomes at home in abstractions and in progressing by means of notions free from sensuous substrata, develops an unsuspected power of assimilating in rational form all the various knowledges and sciences in their complete variety. Such is the task of Hegel's logic, which by the way, is not a traditional logic, he says, treating thought forms as separate from their contents. According to Hegel, logic's content is the pure essence of concrete knowing. It considers concrete objects as thoughts in their complete abstraction, but there is no separation of thought forms from their contents 
because it is the thought forms themselves which comprise logic's content. Because of this, a true science of logic cannot partake of the same method as other sciences. It cannot suppose, presuppose the essential thought forms of its scientific practice and simply elaborate their various relations. Rather, it must derive these thought forms en route to discovering its own ground, which appears not at the beginning of the exposition, but as the exposition's result. Indeed, logic's beginning must be presuppositionless, and each subsequent stage of its development must be shown to follow necessarily from the one preceding it, such that the entire system unfolds epigenetically, like the natural genesis of an organism. There are strong indications early on in the science of logic that life, the interproposive activity of living creatures, provides a model for this activity of thought. Hegel complains that traditional logic is dull and spiritless because it treats the forms of thought, definitions, rules of inference, syllogisms, as external to each other, as if they were not imminently and necessarily connected as moments in a purposive development, as the parts of an organism are. And in an early chapter in the Doctrine of Being division, at the begin towards the beginning of the book, Hegel compares the self-transcending activity of plants, of plants to thought, writing, the plant transcends the limitation of being a seed similarly of being blossom, fruit, and leaf. The seed becomes the developed plant, the blossom fades away, and so on. Reason, thought, is nothing but this overcoming of limitation. So what we have here in the science of logic is not a traditional general logic, but neither is it the same as the transcendental logic that Kant develops in his critique of pure reason. Hegel's science of logic will study the relationship between concepts and objects as Kant's transcendental logic does. But it will not, its author insists, try to get clear about the cognitive instrument before using it, nor will it limit human, cogni human cognition to judgments about the appearances of objects while leaving things in themselves, which are themselves figments of subjective thought, as unknowable. That would be to take away with one hand what the other hand pretended to give. Thus, Hegel's logic will be inspired by Kant's transcendental logic while rejecting some of its main conclusions. However, if we believe Karen Ng, Hegel remains committed systematically to developing an underdeveloped insight from Kant's critical philosophy, namely the idea of internal purposiveness or life that Kant describes to the form of the organism in the critique of judgment. Kant's great service to philosophy, Hegel says, was his introduction of this concept of uh, this regulative concept of life as a guide for reason. His great oversight was failing to see that life is constitutive of reason. So with those preliminary um, thoughts in place about Hegel's science of logic, let's talk in more detail about Karen's book. Hegel's concept of life begins with the observation that Hegel references life quite often in relation to thought, and that these references are not superficial, that Hegel means to suggest actually, not that life is like, that, that thought is like life, but that thought is a dynamic living activity in constant development. What begins as a readerly observation becomes the book's central interpretive claim. Ng argues that Hegel's most sustained and original contribution to the post-Kantian context was to suggest that the idealist project cannot be completely and coherently articulated without a systematic accounting of life's essential and constitutive role in the processes and activities of absolute knowing. That idealism itself as a philosophical program stands or falls depending on whether it can successfully integrate a concept of life into its core philosophical ideas. The book's subtitle, Self-Consciousness, Freedom, Logic, points to three problems of post-Kantian philosophy that Hegel attempts to solve with the concept of life. The problem of self-consciousness concerns the absolute ground of knowledge, which Hegel primarily works out through his critiques of Kant and Fichte outlined in chapters two and three of Ng's book. The problem of freedom or self-determination concerns how thinking activity is compatible with and actual in the order of nature. Hegel addresses this problem in, in part through his critical engagements with the philosophies of Schelling and Spinoza outlined in chapters three and four of the book. The problem of logical form concerns the transcendental logic that Hegel inherits from Kant, where there's an a priori unity, identity and synthesis between concept and object such that concepts can be identified as the essential form of an object in general. This problem spans Hegel's science of logic and is a major theme in chapters four through eight of Ng's book. In general, Ng tries to convince us that Hegel provides answers to these three problems by means of what he calls the concept, concept with a capital C, 
but that Hegel's theory of the concept cannot be coherently presented or defended without reference to the constitutive and positive role played by the concept of life. One might ask why these three problems? Why are they necessarily interrelated? It's perhaps easiest to see the link between self-consciousness and freedom. As Robert Pippin notes in his recent book, Realm of Shadows, Hegel presents the activity of self-conscious thinking as liberating. In self-consciously thinking itself, thought is on a voyage in the course of which it gives itself its own determinations, determining itself from within. But what is the necessary connection of logical form to self-consciousness and freedom? This is where Ng's study of Hegel's concept of life truly makes its mark. On her view, the logical form of life activity furnishes an a priori ground for self-consciousness as well as form constraints for its freedom. In other words, we cannot fully understand the meaning of self-consciousness or freedom without an understanding of logical form as grounded in life. Such are the high philosophical stakes of this book. Out of these three interrelated problems emerge three interrelated claims about Hegel's attempts to address, address the problems. The first is that Hegel's concept of the concept, again, the concept with a capital C, a core tenet of his philosophy is based on the purposiveness theme from Kant's critique of judgment. In that work, Kant says that nature's purposiveness toward human cognition is the condition for the non-arbitrary operation of judgment. Kant understands this purposiveness externally on the, on the model of intentional design. We conceive of nature's purposiveness as if it were designed to fit our cognition. But Kant distinguishes this external purposiveness of nature from an internal purposiveness that is modeled in the self-organizing form of living organisms. Kant thinks we can appeal to this purposiveness as an aid to teleological judgments about natural objects that do not appear to follow mechanistic laws. For reasons I'll say more about soon, Ng argues that Hegel seizes upon this latter formulation of purposiveness as a model for the concept. Specifically, what the self-organizing form of the organism models for the concept is the unity of imminent form with concrete individuality, the universal species concept that enables individuals to be determined as the determinate individuals they are. Ng has to meet a formidable demand in executing this first claim, for it requires a thorough interpretation of Kant's purposiveness theme as well as Hegel's appropriation of it. Um, I'll say more about that toward the end of my remarks. For now, I'll just say um, how consistently this claim is carried out throughout the entire book. Uh, it's the main point of departure for the story of how Hegel develops his concept of life, and it's the ultimate anchor, uh, even in Ng's conclusion about Hegel's philosophical method. So it's a very, very important point. The second big claim of the book emerges out of the first. Ng wants to show that in the course of developing the speculative identity thesis, or the thesis that philosophical method is a dialectic of life and self-conscious cognition, Hegel presents the ground of knowledge as having a double constitution in which life is the immediate manifestation of the concept. Put another way, judgments are actualizations of the unity and activity of life form, both enabled and constrained by life. According to Ng, in order to make sense of life as the immediacy of the concept, we must grasp that life is not a determination that is ultimately overcome or fully sublated by self-conscious cognition, but that the identity and opposition between life and self-consciousness constitute the process and activity of knowing, a dialectical process that Hegel calls absolute method. Ng's exposition of the second claim is rigorously uh, intertextual. She finds its primordial formulation in Hegel's Differentschrift, an early work wherein Hegel compares the philosophical systems of Fichte and Schelling and attempts to resolve their insights into a higher unity. Hegel gives Fichte credit for positing the activity of the self-conscious I against the activity of a not I, but takes issue with how Fichte underdetermines the not I in certain respects and how he construes the process of knowing as the I's infinite striving towards the not I. Hegel follows Schelling, meanwhile, in conceiving of self-consciousness in nature as subjective subject object and objective subject object, respectively terminology which highlights the original division of subject and object in the living organism that is cause and effect of itself. It's at this stage of his thinking that Hegel begins to understand life's a priori contribution to thought, which is to say, not as a mere analogy to self-consciousness, but to borrow Schelling's phrase as a visible proof of transcendental idealism in as much as self-consciousness requires the concrete formal features of life, internal purposiveness of form, et cetera, in order to be actual. The last big claim of the book emerging out of the first two is that Hegel's subjective logic, which comprises the first section 
um, of the third division of the science of logic called the doctrine of the concept should be read as a critique of judgment that aims to demonstrate the degree to which judgment is grounded in life. Ng's defense of this claim is her most formidable achievement, I think, not least because she has to navigate some of the most abstruse passages of an already very difficult text in order to execute it. Commanding Hegel's obscure terminology, Ng explains how what Hegel calls an original judgment of life fully establishes the constitutive role of internal purposiveness in connection with the activities of self-conscious cognition. Or to borrow the memorable formulation iterated throughout the book, life opens up the space of reasons or intelligibility as such. The elaboration of this claim starts as early as chapter four where Ng begins her engagement with Hegel's science of logic at the transition from the doctrine of essence to the doctrine of the concept. Um, my co-panelist is going to say a little bit about this section of the book, so I will leave that uh, to him. Uh, chapter five, which develops Hegel's idea of the original judgment of life out of uh, Holderlin's conception of judgment as an original division of being, is a pivotal moment in Ng's developmental story that I'd like to highlight. Ng uh, sorry, Hegel endorses the notion that an original subject-object division inheres in judgment, but rather than follow Holderlin's line that thought can, be, can but infinitely approximate the original unity of an undivided being, Hegel argues that original division and original unity are equiprimordially manifest in what he calls the original judgment of life. The last several chapters run this claim through Hegel's account of various forms of judgment and syllogisms. Um, these chapters also consider the role of genus concepts or imminent universals in judgments. And finally, um, they consider the purport of life's equiprimordial unity and division for Hegel's philosophical method and system as a whole. Um, there's so much more that could be said about, uh, about the book, and I imagine these things will be said when, when Jason and Karen speak. So I'll conclude my summary there. Um, to wrap up my portion, I'd like to just make one remark about the book's argumentative strategy, something that's drawn some comment in um, uh, other reviews of this book to date. So the way that um, Karen Ng reads Kant's purposiveness theme into Hegel exemplifies, I think, how every major interpretive claim in the book, including some of the smaller ones, are executed. So my understanding of Ng's strategy here is that she tries to validate Hegel's appropriation of Kant's purposiveness theme by showing how Kant himself encounters a problem, namely that of the inadequacy of external purposiveness in establishing the necessary relation, relationship between concepts and objects and judgments. I can't uh, discuss, I can't fully rehearse the, the argument here because it's too involved. But basically, Ng takes another resource within Kant's thought, the idea of internal purposiveness, um, and argues that it is actually the concept object model that Kant is looking for to, to um, solve his problems with reflective judgment. So she tries to show that Kant doesn't figure this out, but that in not figuring it out, he puts a lot of the pieces in place for later, think, later thinkers, Hegel in particular, to make the case for life's constitutive role in determining cognition. So that's the argumentative strategy. And my own view is that it's very illuminating and educational, not just in the history of philosophy, but in terms of showing all of the resonances among, um, among the generation of German idealists. Um, it is noteworthy though that, that several reviewers to date have remarked that um, chapter two's discussion of Hegel's debts to Kant with regard to internal purposiveness are perhaps overstated. So that's a debatable thing, but that's some, something that a, a few reviews have commented on. Um, so I would invite Karen to respond to that, to that commentary about her argumentative strategy in the book and the, um, the strong emphasis on, on Hegel's debts to Kant starting as early as chapter two of, of the book. So thanks, um, thanks for giving me this time and I'll conclude there. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. And now I call upon Jason Yanova to, uh, to give, uh, to continue his commentary, which is going to be more focused from what I understand, and then Karen respond. So Jason, I pass the mic, so to speak to you. Wonderful. And uh, just pasted into the chat a link to a handout that primarily includes some passages I'll point to. And, and while everyone's accessing that, I will join in warmly congratulating Professor Karen Ng. I'll thank uh, Kelly Stolk for this extraordinarily helpful account of the bigger picture of the book. And I'll stress that I'm, I'm really grateful to professors Costa and Dobbs uh, Weinstein for the opportunity to develop a few thoughts in response to Professor Eng's fascinating book. 
uh, a book whose importance has already been widely recognized. And, and just to give you a sense of that right away, uh, and, and please let me know if uh, there are any issues with the handout. Uh, but, but otherwise, in case you don't already know, there, there have been already very in-depth panel discussions in, for instance, uh, Belgium at Leuven, a great center for the study of modern European philosophy, and in the US at the American Philosophical Association uh, annual January conference. Uh, uh, in both cases, on, on uh, Professor Eng's new book, I enjoyed viewing these sessions uh, that I'm aware of in preparation for today, and you may consider taking a look as well. And, and furthermore, there's going to be additional Again, I'm sure very detailed sessions at events in, I understand, Berlin, uh, uh, namely at Humboldt, and probably elsewhere over time. In my, in contrast, uh, brief comments today, I'll just try to build upon what Kelly has just said by zooming in on magnifying with my biologist's uh, microscope, so to speak, a couple of more specific concerns regarding not so much the larger project that, that uh, Kelly covered, but rather three particular themes. These are headings one through three on the handout, which are framed in a somewhat biological uh, terminology in honor of the theme of the book. Even though, uh, let me be clear, Professor Ng's focus is not Hegel's philosophy of nature and his biological account of life, uh, but rather what is specified to be Hegel's logical concept of life, which is intimately intertwined with his critique of the notion of substance that also plays a major role at a crucial juncture in his logic. And, and that's gonna constitute a thread in my comments today. So in each section, I'll say something about Hegel's notion of or critique of the philosophical concept of substance that's intertwined with the concept of life. Under heading one, I'll begin with Professor Eng's account of Hegel on Spinoza, who is just a single organism in the story, so to speak, uh, but nonetheless a key figure in the development of Hegel's logical concept of life and indeed his concept of, of the concept per se. This will then lead me to develop under heading two, a methodological line of questioning and ask about other predecessors uh, and maybe even contemporaries uh, to Hegel. Uh, this uh, uh, will especially lead me to ask about Jakob Burma and eventually the broader constellation or maybe ecosystem that's at hand uh, for Hegel. Finally, uh, three, that somewhat methodological inquiry will lead me to conclude with some thoughts about the underlying motivations of the study, especially as regards its significance for Hegel's practical philosophy, his philosophy of right, his political philosophy. This may then help take us to other domains or, or biological kingdoms, so to speak, beyond theoretical philosophy. And indeed, it's my hope that touching upon these various themes, uh, quite various themes, will help to open up discussion of a wide range of issues that are raised by Professor Ng's book once we get to audience questions, especially because I know that we have today audience members interested not just in German idealism, but also early modern philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy in the Renaissance period, and, and so on. And hopefully these themes will also be fresh to Professor Eng as regards discussion of her book, even uh, despite these prior discussions that I've mentioned a moment ago. And even though she will, of course, have thought about these things in other contexts, despite not discussing them uh, specifically or explicitly so much uh, in her book. So I begin with, uh, uh, with Spinoza in section one of my remarks, she does of course discuss uh, Spinoza. And I'll start off by noting that I think she rightly stresses the great significance of Spinoza's thought to Hegel. Among other things, she cites at the beginning of chapter four, the first text on your handout in Arabic numeral one, uh, which I won't read, but which will be known, I think, to many. And let me note that discussion of Spinoza strikes me to be particularly interesting in the context of Professor Ng's study insofar as uh, the concept of life is glossed by Kant and others as having something to do with being both the cause and effect of oneself. Spinoza's central metaphysical category, substance, is famously cause of itself, causa sui, though perhaps not cause and effect of itself. And, and maybe that's the problem. And so one immediately wonders whether something like that is going on uh, uh, and, and what Spinoza's status will turn out to be for Hegel and for Professor Ng especially because Spinoza was criticizing the period for an allegedly uh, stiff metaphysics. Professor Ng's primary contribution as regards Hegel's relation to Spinoza concerns just this, as in the fourth chapter of the book, she begins to develop her account of Hegel's logic, uh, uh, the science of logic specifically, and goes on to do a great favor to readers of Hegel in so helpfully reconstructing what I think are some of the most obscure passages in Hegel's science of logic, a work that's already uh, extraordinarily difficult. And my question in this uh, uh, first section is, in short, whether in tracing the genesis of the concept that Hegel proposes, uh, 
Professor Ng takes far enough his critique of Spinoza that she's uh, laid out in these uh, pages of chapter four, which cover the concluding section of the science of logic's doctrine of essence, uh, and, and one section of that in particular called actuality. I worked on Hegel's critique of Spinoza in, in various contexts, including with Daniel Bernfin, whom I therefore uh, credit here. And I think there are several senses in which Hegel can be seen as in dialogue with Spinoza. But in chapter four, uh, Professor Ng specifically helps to get at one of the most fundamental issues, namely Hegel's claim that, as a crucial formulation uh, from, the, from the phenomenology of spirit would have it, and this is Arabic two on your handout, uh, everything comes down to grasping and expressing the true, not as substance, but equally as subject. Two things about this passage right away. First, uh, regarding the formulation itself, you may notice that my translation doesn't interpolate a not only X, but also Y structure that's indeed not quite there in the original formulation. Indeed, uh, the original formulation is almost ungrammatical, certainly odd. And I suspect that Hegel is, so to speak, uh, breathing life into his texts with such obstacles set for thought in a really interesting and important way, but I can't go into detail about that here. Second, uh, to provisionally jump ahead to what's central without that textual matter in mind, Hegel certainly thinks that Spinoza's notion of substance wrongly excludes subjectivity, and I think ultimately life, and yet there are at least two ways that Hegel might uh, mean this. The first is A in your handout, namely as a kind of ad hoc uh, criticism on this formulation Hegel is basically just offended at Spinoza's impropriety. Recent scholarship has tried to make sense of Hegel's critique of Spinoza as critique of acosmism, the view that the world doesn't, also individuals don't uh, exist. But I think Hegel is not himself, but rather, for instance, Jacobi in mind, when he writes, I quote Arabic three, uh, what these opponents of Spinoza are really concerned about is not God, but the finite themselves, end quote. Hegel arguably doesn't identify with uh, these opponents of Spinoza, making what I think is again an, an ad hoc argument to defend their own existence and importance. I think Professor Eng would agree with me that, that Hegel is actually more interested or at least just as interested in Spinoza's God, Spinoza's notion of substance, but Professor Eng in any case still writes that she's sympathetic to a more skeptical reader of Hegel's critique, namely Yitzhak Melamed, as you can see in Arabic four on your handout, which I won't read. What I will instead do is simply gloss Professor Ng's reconstruction of what most crucially happens in the engagement with Spinoza towards the end of the doctrine of essence and shifting the doctrine of the concept in Hegel's science of logic. Here, Hegel tries, uh, among other things, to carry on an imminent critique of Spinoza's metaphysics of substance. According to Spinoza's metaphysics, substance, God, or nature is infinite and self-sufficient character. And because for Spinoza, this substance is infinite, it's also expressed <clears throat> necessarily in infinitely many modes, which we would call things in the world, including uh, us. Hegel's claim is, as Professor Ng so nicely demonstrates, that it can be shown that the fact of the necessary expression of substance in its modes, the fact of substance's self-understanding only in its modes, indicates that Spinoza's substance or God without personality is not so uh, self-sufficient after all. As Hegel eventually puts it, and this is Arabic five, I quote, an actual fact, therefore, the absolute, or here Spinoza's substance, is first posited as absolute identity only in the mode. It is what it is, namely self-identity, only as uh, self-referring negativity, end quote. Now, you'll have to read Professor Ng's fourth chapter and beyond to fully understand this difficult passage, admittedly, but basically Hegel's trying to show that for substance to be what Spinoza wants it to be, infinite in character, characterized by what Hegel calls absolute identity, completeness, it has to take on a more lively nature. Or as uh, Professor Ng puts it again in Arabic 5, Hegel's point here is not to defend the finite per se. Uh, that would be A on my handout if I understand Professor Ng correctly. But Hegel's point is rather to defend the priority of the actual over the potential, where the modes are what is truly actual and substance represents an indeterminate power or potential, end quote. Not only does such a defense make room for a kind of freedom that Spinoza thought had to be eliminated, but it simply does justice to the logical movement at hand, according to Hegel. Hegel privileges with Spinoza what's actual over and against what's potential. Again, he's on the same passage as uh, Spinoza here, which, which emphasizes why Hegel's critique deserves further attention, I think. And with such actualist uh, tendencies in mind, Hegel, endorsing what Professor Ng calls the actuality thesis, uh, thinks that therefore substance must also be grasped as subject, self-referring, and, and more dynamic. Only then will substance be grasped as fully actual, or to put it in different terms, 
uh, substance must be subject, must uh, do justice to life. I quote Hegel in Arabic 6. Absolute substance, Spinoza's notion of substance as God or, or nature, is the truth, but it's not the whole truth. It must also be thought of as in itself active and living. And by that very means, it must determine itself as mind or, or geist. Uh, in short, Spinoza must be revived, brought to life, and I think Hegel is, is really onto something here. And so stepping back, he explicitly notes that it's not her interest to uh, assess the power of Hegel's critique of Spinoza, but I wonder uh, uh, whether it could be important to do so if we want to judge whether Hegel is justified in making the moves that he does in the logic. Will Hegel really earn the concept logic to the degree that he thinks he does? Does Hegel point to a proper issue in Spinoza, one that uh, Eng rightly notes, also appears in related form in Fichte, making room for a notion of self-causation and ultimately life that isn't in Spinoza, or indeed also Fichte, but should be. I think there are some stakes uh, here and also really interesting possibilities, and I'd be excited to hear what else Professor Eng has to say on the matter if we have time. I turn now, though, next to the second part of my comments, that is section two on Jakob Burma, and what we might, we might call the uh, larger ecosystem of European thought around and prior to Hegel. And very interesting, I think, about Hegel's critique of Spinoza is that what's missing in Spinoza is, is arguably already in Burma, at least on a possible reconstruction of Hegel that I'll just hint at here. So my point under the second heading is to ask uh, Professor Ng roughly, uh, why not uh, Burma? Why not discuss Burma? Also some, some other figures that don't feature, or because that's not really a fair form of, of questioning, why not X, why not Y, which can just go on forever. My question uh, would rather be, why turn away from the broader context and, and frame things rather uh, specifically in terms of the more canonical references we have today. So really, Kant, Faith, to Schelling, some further than. And, and let me note that I asked this question here at, at Vanderbilt, uh, because I know that this is a almost uniquely open-minded department that regularly engages with heterodox figures in history philosophy from heterodox angles. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear how Professor Eng thinks about uh, how to tell a story like the one she does here and, and what's the best way to do it. And of course, I understand that there are uh, many virtues to, to a more clean uh, story without too many various uh, characters, but but perhaps uh, Professor Ng can say more on that front. Meanwhile, I'll say more about Burma, though, uh, in case she does want to say something about him specifically. And for those who don't know, he was a fascinating, very difficult, indeed uh, partially mystical German thinker around 1600. He was considered by Hegel to be the first German philosopher. And around 1800, his writings grew to be a huge hit, especially in uh, Jena, where Hegel was also based for some time in uh, formative years. Hegel was, among other things, skeptical of the excessive fandom around Burma, obtaining among many German romantics, certainly in uh, Schelling, who takes up much of Burma's terminology in the Freiheitsschrift. Despite this partial suspicion, however, Hegel finds much to praise in Burma, and in particular writes of Burma's grasp of the dynamics of life, I think. Amid discussions of Burma in lectures on the history of philosophy, life, the lively, and so on, come up over and over again. Hegel writes, and this is Arabic 7, that the principle of the concept in Burma is thoroughly alive. He notes that we find in Burma the most lively uh, dialectic. Those are direct passages, quotes. And Hegel later explicitly draws a contrast uh, to Spinoza on that front. I greatly look forward to returning to Hegel in Burma with the resources provided by Professor Ng's monograph in hand, especially with the first theme that I touched upon in mind, because as I noted, it seems like Hegel thinks that Burma accomplishes where uh, Burma accomplishes what Spinoza fails at, namely achieving a lively notion of substance. And I quote Arabic 8, a passage in Burma that Hegel cites, which is so Hegelian that one might think it was written by, by Hegel himself, I think not uh, 200 years earlier by Burma. Burma writes, I uh, quote, no thing can become manifest to itself without opposition, for if it has uh, nothing to withstand it, it always goes forward on its own account and does not go back within itself. But if it does not go back into itself, as into that from which it originally arose, it knows nothing of its original state." End quote. Hegel notes that when Burma refers to an original state or Urstand, he means something like substance, and Hegel regrets that he can't use Burma's terminology as Schelling had already done. Uh, that being said, Hegel does appropriate Burma's image of the circle of circles without always uh, mentioning uh, Burma, and Pro Professor Eng mentions this image as it appears in Hegel in her account of what Hegel means by absolute method at the end of her book. But uh, in any case, can Burma's thought be said to play a role in Hegel's arriving at his concept of life or 
in the critique of Spinoza, moving to the concept logic. Uh, is there something important going on here? I don't know, but I'd be really interested to hear whether Professor Ng thinks so, or whether she'd like to say something just about these methodological questions concerning how uh, uh, to frame a story like the one that she tells, where to draw boundaries in a substantial project like her own. Finally, I turn very quickly to section three, pointing to other philosophical domains or again, uh, biological kingdoms, so to speak, especially political thought, because I'm fortunate to be uh, familiar with Professor Ng's work and to have learned a great deal from it. I know, or I gather, that she has strong interests in political philosophy and specifically also Hegel's philosophy of right. So my last question is, uh, what implications for Hegel's political thought does Professor Ng see in providing account of Hegel's logical concept of life? While freedom plays an important role in her book, as it always must with German idealism, it's obviously also not the central concept. And so I'd be thrilled to hear how she bridges the gap between life and right, perhaps keeping in mind that Hegel returns uh, again to questions of, or at least the terminology of life and substance metaphysics in accounting for the individual's relation to the community and the state at a crucial turn. So, so early on in part three of the philosophy of right often translated as uh, ethical life. Hegel begins this part of the text with the claim that ethical life is the quote, uh, living good. This is at the end of my handout. Uh, and Hegel explains that the objective sphere of ethics is substance made concrete by subjectivity, end quote. My sense is that roughly Hegel wants to explain the rightful relation of the individual to the community as analogous to, or maybe even derivative of the right way of thinking about substance and its accidents or modes uh, namely, uh, uh, the rightful relation would, would have to be conceived in a lively manner in, in all these cases. And I'd be so excited to hear any thoughts from Professor Ng on this front uh, as to whether Hegel's concept of life, a uh, uh, better understanding of Hegel's concept of life can help us to better understand his philosophy of right, uh, or on any other front, if some thought I've begun to develop above uh, uh, in, my, in my comments today seems uh, interesting. So I pass things to you and I thank you again. Thank you, Jason. And now we pass it on to Karen to respond to, to respond to her two commentators, uh, to the rich comments. And as we see, we've got some marginal comments as well. Uh, so like all medieval history of philosophy, we always have marginalia, uh, which I love, uh, but Karen, please, uh, and thank you. Um, thank you so much to, um, uh, to to Jason and Kelly for those really um, just incredibly helpful comments and questions. Thank you to Emma um, and to Adit um, for organizing all of this and setting this up. Um, it's so nice to uh, talk. It's always nice to talk about the book, but it's so nice to talk about the book, especially at BAMP and in this context, uh, home turf, so to speak. <laughs> um, so um, I also wanted to mention, so just to, I, I know how much I know how much work it is to to read a book and and come up with such you know great things to say about it. So I, I really appreciate the time that you've taken. I should also mention that Kelly is responsible for indexing the book, <laughs> and so I wanted to thank him again. So when you guys are you know if you guys are looking at the book and you're looking for something, um, we can you can thank Kelly for <laughs> all of his excellent work on the index. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll start. Um, I'll start with Kelly's questions. Um, and I really think, um, you know, Kelly, you did such a great job um, <laughs> sort of going through uh, some of the main claims of the book. Um, maybe one thing I'll start by saying, just by making a general remark for those of you who maybe have not just not have read the book, but maybe, you know, haven't um, even read Hegel's logic, uh, which would be totally uh, reasonable because it's a very, very long and, and difficult book. Um, that in focusing on, and Jason mentioned this too, that one of the things I try to do in the book is to focus on the concept of life um, in a logical sense, um, which is actually very weird and bizarre. It's not it, it clear that um, this has a lot of precedent. What does it even mean to say that we're talking about uh, not a biological concept of life, as Jason said, um, you know, something that Hegel might be um, thinking about in the philosophy of nature, but to think about life in a logical context. Um, and I just wanted to maybe set up three, three sort of very broad ways in which I try to think about life as a logical concept or think about life in a logical context. Um, one 
is something that Kelly mentioned um, that I take that, that when Hegel, so Hegel says very famously that the logic is thought thinking itself, um, that this is that basically what is the science of logic? One, it's a very, very abstract, difficult text. And one reason why it's so abstract and so difficult is because Hegel is asking us to enter the realm of shadows and to have think have thought think about nothing but its own activity. So this idea of thought thinking itself obviously has other residences, right? So it has Aristotelian residences. But the idea of thought thinking itself, um, this activity, one of the ways that I try to interpret what it means for thought to think itself is to say that ultimately when thought is thinking about its own activity, eventually one of the things that it comes to realize is that this activity, its own activity is a kind of living activity. And so this is one reason why life becomes so central to a very, very abstract book, which is presumably about nothing other than thought thinking itself. Um, and so that's the most general sense in which I try to, to home in on this logical concept of life. Um, the second is that um, Kelly also mentioned a lot of these metaphors that Hegel uses. Um, Hegel likes to make fun of um, other, uh, other treatments of logic, and he calls them dead bones, <laughs> um, in contrast to his own logical system and his own right dialectical way of thinking, which is always living and dynamic and fluid and active. Um, and I think the one of the other ways in which a, a, the logical concept of life becomes important for reading uh, the science of logic is that he seems to set up the entire system of categories or more, I think more accurately, what he calls the thought determinations, right? So all of these categories that come up in the logic, being, nothing, becoming, quality, quantity, uh, identity, difference, contradiction, right? All of these categories um, that are taken up in this sort of very gradual developmental way in the logic. Um, ultimately, Hegel wants to present the system of categories or thought determinations as a kind of organic living system. Um, I think a more common way of understanding that is just holism, um, but the model that Hegel takes for his holism is always an organic model, right? Where the parts are going to relate to the whole um, in, in the manner of, um, of, of an organism. Um, Jason also asked about Hegel's political philosophy. I think this is another way, this is maybe more famous from his political philosophy that Hegel sort of has this organicist conception of the state, but I think he also has a kind of organicist way of thinking about how our fundamental categories of thinking relate to one another um, develop um, as a whole. Um, the third and final way that I try to think about life in a logical context is through the problem of judgment. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, I try to argue that the subjective logic, which is the third and I think the most important um, part of the science of logic, um, it, it, that, that the subjective logic can be read as a, a kind of version of Hegel's critique of judgment. Um, I also spend a lot of time investigating um, the chapters on judgment and syllogism and thinking about how Hegel treats the different forms of judgment. Um, and that uh, it turns out that life plays a really important role even in those chapters where it, it, it's, not, it's not always obvious because he actually doesn't, right? He doesn't talk about life when he's talking about the different kinds of judgment, you know, the judgments of existence or the judgments of the concept. Um, but I, I think that there are many ways in which he sets up um, what I think, uh, what, what he calls the judgment of the concept, which is um, for him a kind of fundamental form of how we make evaluative judgments. So when we say that something is true or something is good or something is beautiful, um, that uh, there, there's a way in which he thinks about those very judgments as somehow modeled on thinking about um, organic form and organic activity. Um, um, so that's, those are just some, some really general ways in which I try to take up life in the context of thinking about logic, which is not, um, yeah, it's, it's not always intuitive or obvious because I think it's much more, um, yeah, intuitive for us to think about a biological concept of life as opposed to a logical one. So I'll turn to Kelly's question about Kant. Um, like with so many, and it's funny, I might find myself saying something similar in thinking about Hegel's relationship to Spinoza. Um, you know, philosophers always read other philosophers um, with their own ends in view. <laughs> and so the question of whether or not this is a justified, right, is this a fair reading of Kant um, is, is, is a difficult one for any any interpreter to try to deal with. I mean, I think there is at this point absolutely no doubt um, 
that that Kant was extremely important and influential for for Hegel. I think the way that the scholarship seems to be moving is to move between thinking about different moments in Kant. Right, different scholars are going to argue that different moments in Kant are the most important um, for thinking about some particular problem. Um, and I think we have a lot of example. Right, so it's it's Kant's theory about perception. That's the most. That's that's what gets us from you know the Kant to Hegel story. Um, we also have different versions where um, people argue that no, it's it's a constant way of thinking about the intuitive understanding. That's how we get from Kant to Hegel. Um, and so in in positioning myself in in relation to to this very rich uh, scholarship, I tried to argue that it is this concept of internal purposiveness. Um, and Kelly uh, noted that one of the quote, one of the passages from the Science of Logic that I lean very, very heavily on for my interpretation is that in the section on teleology in the logic where Hegel says that one of Kant's greatest services to philosophy is this concept of internal purposiveness. Um, already in that passage, maybe I'll just say something this is maybe a kind of technical, I'll start with a technical point and then I'll get less technical. One puzzle about this passage, he says, uh, Kant's greatest service to philosophy is this concept of internal purposiveness. With this concept of internal purposiveness, he's opened up the concept of life. Uh, and that's what I mean by the idea. And he goes, he sort of gets really excited. Um, but already, strictly speaking, if you are a Kantian, you're going to read this passage and maybe think that Hegel is already uh, equivocating between a number of different ideas in Kant that Kant himself separates out very clearly. So um, for Kant, right, even this con the concept the concept of a natural purpose for Kant is not the same as the concept of life. Um, Hegel, and I think also, Schell, so I would say Hegel's not alone here. I think Schelling too does this. Um, Hegel sort of simply uh, assumes that Kant in talking about the form of a natural purpose is talking about life. Um, but it, again, if we're going to be careful or very strict about how we're interpreting Kant, already we can say Hegel's not exactly getting Kant right there because the concept of life for Kant is actually something very different. Um, and so that's just, I guess, a, a technical point about how difficult it is to, to manage, I guess, um, how, uh, how philosophers read other philosophers. <laughs> um, I think I would defend, so do I think the emphasis on Kant is overstated? I, I think I would defend that, I don't think it is overstated. I think um, the, the the way in which um, one of the one of the passages that I take to be very important in my interpretation is the way that Hegel thinks about life in terms of judgment. Um, it's a passage that isn't very people don't usually point to it very much, but it comes up in a in an important moment near the end of the science of logic where Hegel actually describes. Um, the activity of life in terms of the activity of judgment. Um, and in addition to Kelly pointed out this uh, connection to Hodelin, which is very important that um, Hegel gets the idea of judgment as original division from Hodelin. But I think in, in concluding the logic by going back to thinking about the connection between judgment and life, I just, I, I would just say that I would, I guess, try to defend the emphasis <laughs> um, on Kant and the purposiveness theme, because I just think that it shows goes up um, over and over and over again, um, and especially in that very important moment at the end of the science of logic. Um, maybe I'll say, let me say two more things about the connection to Kant. Um, one is that Kant, did Kant himself, right, there's always the Kant figured this out, but right, he can't miss his own best insight. There's a lot of, you know, the, these ways of talking about um, how philosophers relate to their own work. I think one of the most interesting moments in the critique of judgment is when Kant himself comes to the realization that thinking about purposiveness in external, in an external sense. So thinking about basically external purposiveness is basically just a, a kind of instrumental, right, means that external means ends relationships. And he comes up with all these examples where um, sandy soil is good for spruces. That's the relation of external purposiveness. Um, and of course, anytime you, you go down that path of thinking about external relations of purposiveness, very quickly you get to um, very anthropocentric ways of thinking, right? So basically, uh, sandy soil is useful for growing spruces, you know, spruces or, are, are useful, you know, for all kinds of human activity. Hegel likes to say that um, cork, cork trees were made so that we could have bottle stoppers. <laughs> uh, very quickly, that kind of reasoning leads to um, 
Um, it's a very short step from there to all kinds of anthropocentric ways of thinking about nature. Um, and there's a very important passage where Kant says very clearly that this thinking about nature in terms of external purposiveness is a contradiction in terms. Um, I take that to be a very important moment in trying to figure out this, both in terms of, okay, how far did Kant get with respect to this thought, as opposed to, you know, is Hegel just reading it into Kant or trying to pull it out of Kant? Um, I think the place where I would go to think about that question is when Kant himself comes to the conclusion that thinking about nature in terms of external purposiveness is a contradiction in terms. Um, I, I think he comes to realize that it, there's, there's a big problem in thinking about nature as externally purposive as opposed to internally purposive. Um, the last thing I'll uh, last thing I'll say about the Kant, the importance of Kant, is that I think in the book I do try to. Um, the importance of Kant is mediated through uh, Schelling. Um, I think in addition to emphasizing just how important the purposiveness theme is for the post-Kantians, I try to do this by recovering also the importance of Schelling, um, which who, who has been, um, so in, in Pippin's early book, um, he calls Schelling, Schelling is a problem to be overcome. <laughs> um, there's a kind, he calls it the Schelling problem. Um, uh, recently, there's a, a recent review by Peter Dews that just came out on this new volume um, of, of edited, an edited volume of essays on Schelling. And Dews sort of makes the same point that Schelling sort of has been in this uh, interest uh, in the last 30, 40, you know, however you want to count it, uh, years in, in Anglo-American scholarship on German idealism. Schelling has kind of been been, right, a kind of, uh, he's been sidelined. <laughs> um, and maybe part of the reason for that is just because I think Schelling is very difficult. <laughs> um, and Schelling's philosophy, um, you know, that that's maybe, maybe it's not, you know, people would dispute this, but of course he's known, his philosophy is known also for being so protean, it changes. And so the way that I try to um, make the case for the importance of the purposiveness theme, it is also mediated through trying to recover the importance of Schelling, at least the shelling of a very particular period um, in which uh, Hegel is writing the Differentschrift and um, in, in that Jena period. Um, and one of the claims that I make is that uh, uh, Hegel ends up developing these early Schellingian insights in a more interesting and consistent way than Schelling does himself. Um, that's maybe, the, we can talk more, if people have questions about that, we can talk more about it in the, in the discussion. Obviously that's a, um, you know, Schellingians might want to dispute that. <laughs> so um, just turning to Jason's questions. Um, thank you for asking about Hegel and Spinoza. Um, part of me is going to say that I, um, I'm looking forward to hearing from the Spinozists in the room. I know there are, <laughs> are Spinozists here who are going to um, do much better with the Spinoza than me. Um, I also really appreciate that you pointed out, um, I think what, in, in my treatment of Hegel and Spinoza, I try, maybe tried to be even more careful because I think um, Hegel's, so what I tried to differentiate was whether Hegel's critique of Spinoza was correct from what I think we can learn about what Hegel is trying to do in his critique of Spinoza. And I was more interested in the second than the first, because I think in adjudicating the first, um, I, I would have just had to go into, you know, maybe it could have been a whole other chapter to really do justice to a lot of the complicated issues there. Um, maybe just again to supply some more context um, within within the why Spinoza is so important in the science of logic. You know, J Jason discussed this, I think, very helpfully. Um, one is, as you mentioned, that this this idea of causa sui um, clearly is one way in that 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 the puzzle of what what exactly is a causa sui, right? If substance is causa sui, um, you you mentioned also the path through ficta, trying to think about the I as a kind of self self cause. <laughs> um, that clearly this puzzle trying to think about this question of a self-cause, but through different means is clearly one of the ways in which Spinoza is important. I think there are some others. Another way in which I try to say that at a very general level, that the, that the way that Spinoza figures, um, Deo sive natura, that, that this idea of God or nature 
is clearly inherited by Hegel and Schelling by thinking about this relationship between nature and broadly what they call mind or intelligence or geist. Um, and that this is their way of trying to inherit um, Spinoza's way of thinking about Deo Sive Natura. Um, in, within the context of the logic itself, um, Hegel, for better or for worse, decides to um, in, make the argument for what he calls the imminent deduction of the concept. So Spinoza is so important because this, um, this moment where Hegel is finally right, giving us his deduction of the concept, um, he does it by way of a reading of Spinoza. Um, and it's in some ways, it's a very odd choice. If I'm honest, I think it's one of the most difficult sections of the logic <laughs> to, to read and make sense of. Um, it's uh, even within the context of a very difficult book, I think. It's it's um, at such a high level of 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 abstraction that in some ways maybe maybe it wasn't the best path that Hegel could have taken <laughs> to to um, make the argument for the deduction of the concept. But regardless, this is how he does it. Um, Jason, I I. I I, I thought it was helpful to think about it in, in relation to Fichte, because Fichte would be the other place where um, not just the content of Spinoza's philosophy, but in terms of method, where Fichte tries to get us into his system also by um, you know, making that distinction between dogmatism and criticism and showing us why we have to, we have to reject the dogmatic path, uh, the Spinozist path in order to enter Fichte's system. Um, it, I, I didn't think about it this way, and this is not how I presented it in the book, but I think it would be interesting to, to that Hegel might be resist, both agreeing and resisting with uh, Fichte in an interesting way here by trying to um, get out of Spinoza, <laughs> really trying that those those lines where he says, right, basically all, all true philosophy begins with Spinoza. It's spin, spin, Spinozism or... I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. It's you know Spinoza or no philosophy at all. <laughs> so he is clearly trying to um, use the term. So the specific way that I say in the book, he's trying to literally transform Spinoza's metaphysics of substance, attributes, and modes into his language of the concept, which he understands in terms of universality, particularity, and individuality. So that's the very complicated context in which Spinoza becomes important. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what else I have to add here. I'm, I look forward to hearing from the Spinozists in terms of what they, they, they think about Hegel's critique of Spinoza. I do agree with you. I think the eight cosmism charge is not the strong, is strongest, um, um, critique of Spinoza. Um, I think maybe the more the, the one where I think Hegel's going to really insist on is the method. I think his obje his 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 objection to Spinoza's method that I think is one that is very very important for he has to be right about that in order for his uh, method to make sense. Um, so that might be, I think, uh, um, a critique where I would be more willing to defend Hegel. The acosmism charge, I very deliberately in the book did not take a stance on that because I think I I'm not sure that the acosmism charge is, is, is a good one. Um, okay, sorry, I'm keeping my eye on the time here. So I'll, I'm gonna try to be very quick. Uh, Burma, <laughs> thank you for, um, there are so many, um, I guess, less discussed figures. Like I said, I, I thought in bringing Schelling, Schelling is not a minor figure, but I think Schelling is not necessarily a very, very well understood figure. So in the text, uh, in, in the book, um, Schelling and, and Hördelin are going to be the figures that, besides Kant, uh, of course, um, that I, I, I spent much more time on. Um, I have to say, you know, Hegel talks about Burma all the time. I will be perfectly honest, I don't know that much about Burma's philosophy. One thing I will say is that the mysticism is, um, um, and, and it's not just Hegel's general aversion to mysticism, but I think at the level of method, um, that while it does, it certainly seems to be the case that Hegel has a lot of positive things to say about Burma, um, the Burma's mysticism may not be, 
helpful, especially in the context of the logic, um, given the importance of method for that text. Um, and so I guess that would be maybe uh, I'd be interested my question back to you, given that I don't know that much about Vuma, um, whether or not, despite the sort of many obvious similarities in terms of what their the, the way that that passage that you pulled, I thought was very helpful. Um, but at the level of method, given Vuma's mysticism, whether or not that that could be made compatible with what Hegel's trying to do. Um, I agree with you that Jacobi and, and, and Goethe are also really important. I didn't spend that much time on Goethe because I think uh, Eckhart Furster has already done, uh, uh, I wasn't gonna do a better job than Eckhart Furster in taking up the relationship between Goethe and Hegel. So I, you know, I, 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 his work is important uh, for, the, for, for my understanding of um, a lot of these issues, but I just didn't um, uh, think I could do a better job than, than, than Eckhart. Um, the last question, I'll um, punt to uh, Dean Moyer's new book. So uh, Hopkins is <laughs> the place to be. Um, the, the idea that ethical life is the living good is something, this is a passage that I actually, uh, I didn't talk about it a lot in the book, but it's it's one of my favorite passages in, in all of Hegel. So thank you for, 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 for mentioning it. Um, uh, Moyer's new book clearly tries to think about Hegel's metaphysics of value in connection to, to the concept of life, uh, the way that Hegel thinks about life in Hegel. So this is just very exciting to me that I think, although I focused on life in the logical context, I think it's very evident and scholars are increasingly aware of just how important the concept of life is for thinking about all kinds of other problems in Hegel. And I think uh, Dean's book is the one that's going to use life to think about the metaphysics of Hegel's metaphysics of value. Um, the only thing um, I do, the closest I get to thinking about the, the sort of ethical dimension of this, of course, Hegel does talk about the idea of the good at the very end of the logic. Um, but again, I'll just go back to the way that Hegel thinks about evaluative judgments. Um, I do spend a little bit of time in the book um, when when Hegel tries to think about the very form of the judgment of saying, right, something X, the way that he puts it is that some X constituted so-and-so is good. Um, and he tries to unpack what it is that we mean when we make those kinds of judgments, when we say that something is good or when we say that something is bad. And there again, the concept, the, 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 the concept of life is important because I think he takes um, his model for thinking about the goodness and badness of things is a kind of, you know, today we would think about this in terms of a natural form of goodness. Um, I think there are a lot of connections between the way that Hegel thinks about these kinds of judgments and contemporary ethical, the way that contemporary ethical naturalists think about these kinds of judgments. It's clear that when he says that and some X constituted so-and-so is good, the goodness of some X is always understood in relation to a relevant species or genus concept. Um, that doesn't literally have to be that doesn't mean that we can only so obviously not all things have a species concept in the sense of a bi right, biological things have an, a genus or species concept but the model is there so the most helpful way that I think about this in, is in the context of art actually um, the way that Hegel thinks about you know genres in art um, I think speaks to the importance of the genus or species context for determining the goodness and badness and beauty um, uh, rightness, right? All of these 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 predicates that he talks about in the logic, um, that the genre in in art, right? Of course, we don't have a biological species concept, but the reason why genres are so important for Hegel, the reason why we don't just evaluate, um, you know, we we something is good as a sculpture or something is good as poetry, <laughs> something, right? We we don't we can't just talk about art or 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 art beauty um, in in complete isolation from thinking about genres, I think that speaks to um, this broader way that Hegel thinks about how we make judgments always in connection with, right, the relevant genus or species concept. Um, and the model there is, uh, again, I think a, it, it's, it's, it's an organic model, it's a biological model, um, but I'll stop there um, because I think I've, I've said a lot. I just thank you again to Kelly and Jason for, for your really helpful questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, this was a lovely session. Now, please do not jump the line. I know that people have written in, sent comments, but I would like you to now go in order and pose things as questions. So please.
go to the chat and post things as question. I will refrain as, as a Spinozist, I, but since I'm a moderator, I must refrain and perhaps come back to it on the Hegel um, reading of uh, Spinoza, or for that matter, Schelling's reading of Spinoza in the Freiheitsschrift. But uh, please uh, post your questions and as, que as questions or tell me that you have a question and I'll call on you in order. So I'm opening it to the audience. I got, okay, on the list is third. Okay, but uh, I, so I take it, Corina, do you want to be first? Okay, Corina. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, so can you ask it? Uh, you had a, a couple of long comments. Can you have it specified specifically as a question to Karen? Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll try to do that. It, does, Karen, does Karen feel that in the way she's um, understood Hegel's concept of life and how it relates to the con his concept of the concept, would that mean that it's an affirmation of the whole idea that dialectical um, change, dialect the dialectics is both in life and in thought, and therefore not just a construct of thought? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, I think the short answer is yes. Um, I don't, so dialectics is something that I discuss only at the very end of the book. Um, and it's in part because, so even though, you know, if, 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 ever, if, if anyone knows anything about Hegel, it's right, dialectical method. Um, but I do think it's important that it's something that Hegel discusses really only at the very, very end of the logic. Um, it's not something that he he begins with in the logic. Um, I do say that the way that Hegel ultimately ends up thinking about um, in the logic, he talks about it as a relationship between a beginning and dialectic. Um, I think at the end of the logic, uh, he does return to the importance of life and inner purposiveness. Other words he uses in that context are drive. Um, and so it's clear that dialectics for him, um, although he never he never actually, um, maybe, you know, Jason and Kelly, tell me if I'm wrong, I can't think of a place where he explicitly connects life with dialectics. Um, but I do think that the way that he thinks about, um, so in the context of the logic, it's, it's the drive of thinking, right? So why does thought move from being to nothing? <laughs> why is it that thinking is driven, right, constantly uh, towards the next thought determination. Um, I do think that he thinks about that dialectical activity of thinking as ultimately driven by living activity and living drive, um, but um, that's not something that he can establish at the beginning of the logic. Um, it's something that only at the end we can kind of reconstruct um, how it is that thought was constantly driven to, to continue to the next moment. Um, but as Kelly mentioned, the beginning of the logic has to be presuppositionless. So he can't begin the logic by saying, well, thought is living, thought is alive. That's how it is. That's how thought can be always driven toward, right? That being can move to nothing and to becoming and so on and so forth. Um, it's only after a very long, long um, process that at the very end of the text, he can associate life with dialectic, um, but uh, the the short answer to the question is yes. I, I the the idea that dialectics um, is present in both life and thought is a very nice way of putting it. I think in general, again, because of his um, deep, I think Schellingianism here, the 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 homology, the the way in which there is a speculative identity between life and thinking is just a theme that is recurrent throughout all of his philosophy. Um, and I think that's that's a that's the Schillingian thought that I, I said earlier, I think he develops further and sort of more consistently than maybe even Schelling does. Great, thank you. And now Gennaro, do you want to be next? Do you have a question? Great. Yes, thank you, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much for the presentation and thank you, Karen, for the book that I started 
reading and studying is very deep and difficult. Uh, so thank you very much. And the question, just to keep it brief, I would like to read my, my question, um, which would be the conceptual, in your opinion, the conceptual identity or positivity of matter starting from inorganic matter, apart from the spiritualization or conceptualization. I refer here to a structural role of matter as externality, general category, not only in the anthropology or in philosophy of nature, but, but tracing back its very definition to the science of logic, of logic and most of all the, the logic of being, the discussion, the dialectic of, of quantity in which the, the positivity of uh, extension, um, of quantitative extension is in the discussion with Kantian, with Kantian antinomies uh, defined as uh, indif indifference. So this is the logical, this is the, the logical or origin of the category of externality, and then which could be the positivity, the inner positivity in the other stage of the system, uh, a part of the obvi obvious uh, spiritualization um, at the end of the yes of the philosophy of spirit. So that's the question. Thank you very much. Thanks. So are you are you asking about the, so given my emphasis on life, are you asking about the role of basically inorganic matter or non-living nature? Um, how 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 would how to account for that in Hegel's uh, yeah. yeah, yes, because I was very interested about the the yes the 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 logical account of life, and so the the the, the concept of matter of the category of matter as something as something ex external or uh, as, as a, um, it's, it's very difficult to 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 um, to be maintained as a as something positive as something that on which life could uh, rest upon or in the in the so that's that's the question which is the the concept of positivity of something that is indifferent or contradiction or external in itself. So that's the question. So in the logic, it seems that. Hegel, so he taught he the transitions from mechanism to chemism to teleology might be the most important uh, in this context. Um, I do think that um, right. So there are lots. There's there. There's been a lot of scholarship on how exactly Hegel argues for the priority of teleology over mechanism. Um, but one thing that uh, the, the way that I try to, um, this is actually the shortest chapter of the book, um, the way that I try to understand the, 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 tr the moves from mechanism to chemism to teleology is first of all, they are, even though there is a priority of teleology over mechanism, um, it's not the case, Hegel also wants to describe the processes of mechanism such that they can be seen to be continuous with what ultimately becomes a form of purposive activity. Um, so he is not denying and that in fact, even when he talks about living things, living things are um, a concatenation of mechanical, chemical and uh, purposive processes. So mechanism isn't simply, even though it's very important that uh, for Hegel, that in order to understand not just life, but self-determination, um, freedom, thought, all of these things that we have to move beyond mechanism. Um, mechanism isn't sort of cast aside as, it, it, he, he doesn't try to reintroduce some kind of um, metaphysical or ontological divide between say living and non-living things. Um, so the continuity there I think is also really important. Um, and so the, the easiest way of putting it is that, yeah, for him, living things both, part both are made up of and participate in all kinds of mechanical, chemical, and teleological processes. So he doesn't um, exclude, or even in trying to argue for the priority of teleology, he's not trying to exclude um, mechanism uh, from the account. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emma? Hi, thank you so much. This is really a wonderful meeting um, for so many reasons. Um, I'm gonna partially take on my Spinoza's role here. I'll leave it a lot of space. 
Uh, because I think this, my question really tags on Gennaro's. Um, because what I, I, I think I'm thinking, and I'm referencing here the very first conversation I had with Karen, in which we discussed Jonas. Uh, I don't know if she remembers. But yeah, <laughs> so the, there's a, a very beautiful article in which Jonas focuses on Spinoza and organism, uh, which has been in my mind throughout this conversation. And there, I think uh, a lot of focus is on the mariology of organisms, right? And um, I think that might be a crucial point where Spinoza and Hegel have a lot of trouble with each other. Uh, because the parts of organisms, as I am understanding your interpretation of Hegel, um, cause each other in some way, right? Uh, they have some kind of production um, relationship to one another. Whereas I don't think that Spinoza's parts of finite individuals can cause each other. They don't have that kind of causality uh, within organisms, right? And for this reason, I think um, I think Gennaro's question was, was the perfect one to precede this one, because I think mechanism and organicism are the two opposite tendencies of meteorological thought, right? Uh, one that grants priority to the part over the whole and the other way around. So I was just thinking, maybe this is another way of framing the conflict between Sp Spinoza and Hegel. And maybe this is also why Hegel gets so mad about Spinoza's method because he doesn't deduct one part from the other, right? Which Spinoza simply can't. That's extremely helpful. Um, and the way that Hegel always puts the, the objection to Spinoza's method is that basically that the method is not adequate to its subject matter. Um, that right methods basically for, he for Hegel always says that, well, the method has to be adequate to the subject matter, right? It, it, it matters what we're talking about. And the geometric method is simply the wrong method if we're interested in, you know, understanding ultimately self-determining thought. <laughs> um, so I think that's really helpful. Um, your point about muriology is also helpful because maybe this is one place where, um, and I think I could have been more clear about this in the book. So I think in Kant, this idea that the parts cause one, th this causality between the parts um, and the way, so Hegel is taking this on from the way that Kant understands that the causality of a natural purpose as being a cause and effect of itself. And actually this speaks to something Jason, you talked that there might be a difference between causa sui um, and something being a cause and effect of itself. And I think that's right. Um, and so what Hegel is, I, I think the, the main point of departure for Hegel is how Kant thinks about the natural purpose. Um, that those that passage in the Critique of Judgment where he's talking about the tree, um, right, that basically it reproduces um, its kind, it reproduces um, its parts by drawing from the environment, but also this the way that the parts produce one another um, in relation to a whole. Um, the puzzle is that um, on the one hand, I do think that this the way that Kant thinks about a natural purpose is extremely important for Hegel. On the other hand, I actually think that the way that Hegel treats the concept of life, questions of muriology kind of fall away a little bit. Um, one evident, one piece of evidence for this is that um, he does uh, have a section on, on the relationship between part and whole near the end of the doctrine of essence. Um, and sometimes he's actually in that section, he, he's actually a little bit dismissive that, that simply thinking about part whole relations um, can capture something like the relationality of the absolute or the relationality of the concept. Um, when he talks about life, I think, uh, although he does, he is very clear that an organism exhibits a part whole relation that is distinct, that, that, is, that is very distinctive and basically distinctive to life. It seems that he is more interested in thinking about life in terms of activity. Um, what interests him in the, the, right, especially in those final sections of the logic is to think about living activity rather than think about, you know, the form of the organism and how there's a very specific kind of part whole relation that is exhibited by the organism. Um, I don't think he, he doesn't deny that 
that. And, and really, I think he's just taking this on from Kant, but the emphasis is somewhat shifted um, away from questions of muriology and more thinking about, well, what is the form of living activity? Well, what do living things do? <laughs> um, how, how are they active? Um, and I try to argue that this is more, you know, it's his way, the emphasis on, on activity is there from Fichte, but I think Fichte leaves the concept of activity somewhat opaque. Um, and Hegel tries to make the concept of activity less opaque by turning to this question of life. Um, maybe I'll say one, one final thing that is a difference, and you can tell me if this, um, now I'm thinking about the very first talk by Susan James on Spinoza on species, Another way that Hegel thinks about the relationship that, that, that the concept of life figures for him, more important than the part whole relation is I think the, um, that, that organisms are exemplary. Their organisms are exemplars of their species or genus. Um, and so that it's this relation, the way that an individual um, is, it's, right, it, it's both an individual and it's an exempl exemplification or manifestation of the genus at the same time. That's another way in which the concept of life is important for Hegel. And I'm not sure if that part piece of it is in Spinoza. Um, and that's why I thought back to the Susan James talk about species, because uh, from my reading of Spinoza, that's not really um, a, a part of how he thinks of um, organism. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, the concept of life for Spinoza bottoms out with individuals. Uh, there's no space uh, for anything that's not relational uh, speciality but it comes out of their reciprocal relations. It's not in them from the beginning. So yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely right. Thank you so much. Great, I'll come back to some of these issues, time permitting, but now I'll turn this to Eliza. Um, thanks so much. Th and uh, thanks to Karen and both of the commentators. And also maybe this is a good time to say thanks to all of you and especially Emma and Edith and Karen for the workshop because this has been, I've really enjoyed coming to these sessions. It's been really wonderful. Thank you for organizing. Um, and so I have a question that I think comes down in the direct, uh, unsurprisingly maybe in the direction of the Kant side of things um, and Kelly's comments. Um, and maybe I'll just say, so one of the things that I really like about your book and that I think is so wonderful about it is that it opens up a new way of coming back to questions that I think people have often, whoops, I dropped something, but uh, that people have often have begun to distance themselves from in the literature, but that actually there's still a lot of things to be done. And uh, specifically, I think in terms of Hegel's account of mind um, and I something that I, so when I read your book, um, and you touched on this a bit in your response to Kelly, you have these different conceptions of life that you're working with throughout the book. Um, and there's two of them in particular that I just wanted to ask you a bit to say a bit more than I um, necessarily understood from the book about how they go together. And specifically, these are the notion of life that seems to really come strongly out of like critique of judgment, 60, whatever, 70, 76, I should know that, um, 76, but where, it's this notion that something that when when a um, purposive thing is an object of knowledge for me, its purposive form it allows me to access it without needing to have sort of a uh, um, non rational uh, input, right? Like it, it, that's what's supposed to be better in some sense about life as a form rather than just mere mechanism because purposiveness is somehow more rational and it gives me um, a rational access to the structure of the thing and this maybe goes back to some of the things that you and Emma were talking about um, but then also I think the most exciting part of the book because we all think the most exciting part is where it lines up with our own interests right um, is that is the, you suggest towards the end that there's um, that life is also a schema um, and perhaps a perceptual schema that provides content to concepts in a different way. So, I, so I'm hearing your first, the first thing is that um, a purpose provides itself with a kind of content by dictating the structure of its parts. But then on the other hand, you also wanna say that being that internal purposiveness, like having that structure, that allows me as, an, as a kind of a purpose to get a hold of the world in some way. Um, and I'm really interested in how those two things fit together. I'm really interested in how it is that, um, I guess maybe just, I, cause you push against logical solipsism early on, but then I wonder how by the, if life is our 
uh, schema for getting hold of the world, I wonder how it doesn't amount a bit to just putting ourselves in the place of the purpose for the objects that we're contemplating, you know? Um, and that in some sense, we leave behind this other idea of the, the objects as giving us their own purpose um, such that we can get a hold of them. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded, but does that make sense, the contrast? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I think that you're you're very right. Th I mean, thank you for this question because you're right that I want both. And I think the critique of judgment, um, you know, te teleological judgments are still a form of reflective judgment. So I like that you po point out that that right this this act the rational access that we have to the structure of, of a very special kind of object that gives us access to the structure of reason as such, I think very helpfully describes one of the way one of the ways in which the concept of life is so important for the idealists. At the at, by the end of the book, so the short answer is um, I do want both because going back to this, I, the, the subject object identity um, and the way that, um, you know, in the early, in, in the Schillingian language, you know, the subjective subject object and the objective subject object, um, it's clear that if it's the case that what we are perceiving in the, or, or what we, what we judge in the form of the organism is something having to do with the form of reason itself, right? It's clear that this has to then be reflected in um, subjective rational activities, um, that something about this same form gives shape to, you know, in, in that more Kantian sense, a kind of a priori shape to, to experience as such. Um, so it's definitely the case that I wanted both of those claims, um, and that I think Hegel needs both to, to say something like both of those claims precisely because he is so committed to the the, the subject object identity. Um, that if if it's the case that this is a form of reason that we can uh, grasp in the object, clearly that form of reason has to inform the way that subjects rationally perceive and conceive of the world. So. That's the way, you know, I, I guess the short answer is that I, I wanted to, it to fit back together in terms of subject object identity. The solipsism, the question, I think one worry that I've heard a lot in different comments from the book is that where I end up, it, 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 so I start by saying that the whole, one of the ways that the concept of life is so important is that it Karen? We've lost Karen. Oh no. It's a bit of a problem. Oh, there she is, I think. Hi, sorry. <laughs> we lost you, yeah. Um. Well, where, where did you lose me? <laughs> Logical solipsism, I think, was the okay. Point. Good. So not that much. Not that much. So it and it's a it's it's a question that's been put to me in a few contexts where it seems like where I end up in the book, despite the fact that I intro one of the ways I introduce the problem of life is that I say, well, life is important because it allows Hegel and Schelling to defeat what they see as Fichte's merely subjective idealism. Um, that Fichte's merely subjective idealism, according to Hegel and Schelling, is in large part due to the fact that he doesn't have this concept of life. Um, however, by the end of the book, it seems like I've reintroduced a different kind of, uh, you, know, you called it logical solipsism, but I take it it's related to sort of subjective idealism worries. Um, and that well, what I've just done is I've kind of reintroduced the subjective idealism problem, but now it's, you know, a living subject, it's a living subjective idealism, but it's still, it's still subjective. Um, the hope is that because of, again, because of the, that first part of what you said, right, that we are, that the rational structure is still something that is manifest in the object. Um, the hope is that that relationship is what, right, avoids the subjective idealism problem. Um, but I, um, I, I think, yeah, I think, I, thank you for your question, because I think thinking about how these two things fit together, 
um, and how they can fit together without reverting to the subjective idealism problems, I think is the puzzle that I was hoping to solve. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? Hi, Karen. Uh, thank you for this awesome session. Um, really enjoying all the discussion. Um, so I guess I have two related questions about sort of the methodology of the logic and uh, the standing of the thought determinations throughout the text. Um, so I guess because you brought up how, and I think Kelly brought this out too, um, how the developmental method of the logic has a kind of organic aspect to it, that there is a sort of, you know, a, a, maybe a, something that is developing the, throughout the text. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what happens when we move beyond from one thought determination to the next? Like you brought up at one point that we need to get beyond mechanism, but that we preserve it in some sense. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, in these cases, what does it mean? What would it mean to preserve these thought determinations? Do some of them simply, you know, die off um, or they're shed off like skin or something? Um, and then I guess the re second related question, um, well, maybe I'll ask it in specific terms and then more general terms that point to the first question. So you brought up how Hegel, you know, is, is against Herderlin's you know, claim that there is an undifferentiated unity that judgment then divides. There's already a sort of identity of subject and object at the bottom of, of things. Um, how does that reflect on the logics beginning with being? Because being seems to be, you know, uh, I mean, I know that there's controversy about whether or not this is actually where the logic begins. Um, and then I guess to just say it in more general terms, um, it seems like there's good reason to think that being isn't a legitimate thought determination in Hegel. Um, would that mean that uh, judging the method would have to be very much a case by case thing with each thought determination that some of the thought determinations have much more staying power than, than others? Thank, um, you. thank you. The, the beginning and being one thing I don't, I, I, probably, you know, if I had more, it's all, it's already too long. Everyone likes a short book as opposed to a long book, but I could have certainly spent a lot more time talking. I, I really start my discussion of the logic with the transition to the subjective logic. Um, so, but you're right to ask about being. Um, be, do I think that being is the, the question of whether or not, or not, I think it's truly the thought first thought determination. Um, Maybe I'll, at the end of the logic, Hegel goes back to the beginning um, and he seems almost uninterested in being <laughs> where he says, yeah, we started with being, but you know, that was so abstract at this point after 800 and whatever pages, um, we now know that the beginning and being was really abstract and there's really not much to say about it now that we're at the end. Um, there's a passage that, um, Right, he says that the determination of being is so impoverished that for that reason alone, not much fuss ought to be made about it. <laughs> so he seems to, although there is a, certainly a lot of discussion and controversy about how the logic can begin, and I think they're all, it's very important and interesting. Um, Hegel himself at the end of the logic does not seem interested in returning to that question of, right, why did we have to begin here? Is being a true thought determination? I think there's a good case to be made that, um, um, right, that maybe becoming is the first true thought determination because of course being and nothing themselves are just too um, indeterminate and, and content frictionless, contentless, <laughs> um, and that it's only when we get to the category of, be or the thought determination of becoming that we have um, enough um, negativity and determinateness to get the, the story moving. So yeah, I think that, so, Go, go, but going back to Hurdlin, I think his disinterestedness in the concept of being at the end of the logic maybe attests to that, that there's really not much to be said. <laughs> there's not much that he can say about being um, at, the, at the end of the logic. Um, and maybe it attests to his disagreement with Hurdlin about being being the ground of judgment. Um, organic 
the the question about the organic development of the thought determinations themselves do certain determinations die off i've never thought of it that way um i always took it to be that the i took the whole i do take the holism seriously so i do think that it's not that we drop the earlier you know what being in nothing notwithstanding because we'll just leave that open as to whether or not those are true thought determinations but um i don't think that they die off in the sense that they become unimportant. I, I take it that it's more that we understand their on their own, they're insufficient. Um, so um, one way that it's been put to me is that, well, if we take becoming to be the proper determination of the absolute, then we've made a mistake. <laughs> if we pause at any moment and take, you know, um, uh, identity and difference to be the way to characterize the absolute, we've made a mistake. Um, but at the end of the day, I do take it that the whole system of thought determinate, they, 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 we understand their proper place and proper role within the context of the whole, rather than saying that you know certain ones die off or become less important. Um, the last thing I'll say about this idea of development, one of the really interesting things about the logic is that even the movement, even the development within the three books of the logic, Hegel uses different terms to describe them, right? So it's sort of passing into one another, um, shining that, that the categories shine <laughs> into one another. Um, and he reserves the term development only for the doctrine of the concept, because it's only once we get to um, what he calls the concept that we can talk properly speaking of development, um, where again, I think that the the notion of development is clearly um, modeled on organic development and growth. Okay, great. Uh, now, Alberto Luis. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you, Karen. Well, I, it's, my comment is, is very, very brief. It's, it's just about that you just mentioned, it's related no, no, to the relationship between Spinoza and, and, and Hegel. And, and it seems to me that you put an emphasis on on, on the method no? many times. And, and I, I just wondering, what do you think about if, if Hegel react to Spinoza more thinking more in, in, in the concept of substance and the consequence of that concept for in, in philosophy, in, in religion. I remember in, in Hegel's times, for instance, on one hand, uh, Herder and Gould, they were very enthusiastic about some some the consequence of, of the con of the concept of substance for religion, for instance, God. But on the other side, Haman or Jacobi react against that conception. So I just I just wondering what do you think if, if or if it's more we can put more emphasis on, on the concept of substance more than in method, which is what was very important for Hegel. But I don't know what do you think about it. I think in the context of the logic. Um, and this is where I think Kant might be more important than Spinoza. Um, I think, and this is controversial, I still think he's a, right, um, because of course, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't in any way mean to say that Hegel is an anti-metaphysical thinker, but he's certainly doing post-Kantian, he's doing metaphysics after Kant's critical turn. Um, and so I do think that the emphasis on method is very deliberate. Um, he also, you know, putting Kant also, the, the, the transcendental doctrine of method is also something that comes at the end of, of the first critique. And so I think that's another way in which the, the emphasis on method, um, I think on Hegel's part is very deliberate. Um, he, I was just, what was I just gonna say? Um, Oh, it's also so another reason why I focus on method as opposed to substance is because I'm in, because it's the science of logic that could be that that's another reason where I think it's not clear that um, in in that transition to the doctrine of the concept, it seems that he is trying to precisely overcome something about the metaphysics of substance in order to get to his version of the logic of the concept. Um, so that's not to say that I think, and I, I, again, I want to be clear, it's not because I think that Hegel is an anti-metaphysical thinker. Um, it's that he is, I, but I, yeah, I, I do think he is doing metaphysics in a post-Kantian context. So whatever the concept of substance means for him, it's going to be, it can't just be 
a straight the straightforward Spinoza version of substance um, and questions of method, precisely questions of how we get into the very you know what what does the concept of substance mean for us? What what does it do for us? How do we get right? How do we even begin to get into um, questions of these metaphysical questions about substance? I think has to right. That's why method is so important because he's not going. I don't think Hegel asks the question of what is substance absent the kind of critical turn that Kant's, you know, we're, we're, we're all, we're only going to ask the question of what is substance once we've done, uh, right, versions and, you know, not just Kant's critical turn, but beyond that, right, then all of the sort of post-Kantian criticisms of Kant's version of it. But the methodological questions, I think, can't be separate from ask, the asking of metaphysical questions about what is substance. Thank you, Karen. I think that we definitely have spilled a great deal over time. So I'm also short, I'm shorting myself, and, but we can have conversations. I've got definitely a lot of comments and a lot of questions and suggestions to make, including the fact that Spinoza doesn't have a method. He has a most, a convention, not the same thing. I have a footnote about that. <laughs> okay, but we can, or even what do we mean by geometric, uh, the real difference between the Cartesian geometry and Euclidean geometry. But this is clearly not the time because I cannot usurp the time and we are already 13 minutes past our time. So I want to thank Karen very much, both for her book and for a great session and our commentators and our um, those raising questions, making comments, etc. And I look forward to seeing you in the summer in our next session. So once again, thank you. And once again, let's raise a hand to Karen's tenure. <laughs> thank you so much to Kelly and Jason. Um, that the was just super helpful. And uh, I, I can't rewrite the book, but it's given me a lot to think about. <laughs> Great, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.